We're in the middle of a series right now on, uh, called Living Hope, which is about how we live out our faith, uh, how what we believe influences how we live. And uh, if we're honest, sometimes it's hard to live out our faith because the world is hostile. Um, and it's not just that the world is hostile to our faith, but the world is a hostile place in general. And w- when Peter was writing to ancient Christians, uh, they also face a hostile atmosphere. Uh, and one, one academic uh, who commented on this, uh, a scholar, described the social climate of the early church that Peter was writing to like this. An environment charged with suspicion and hostility, which has erupted and is liable at any moment and in any place to erupt again in painful incidents. And doesn't that sound like our world? An environment charged with suspicion and hostility. Charged with suspicion and hostility. Um, So in our culture, there is suspicion and hostility toward Christians. And Christians are also notorious for being suspicious and hostile to others. So the question is, how do we live faithfully in an environment of suspicion and hostility? Or more broadly, how do we live well and faithfully in a secular culture? And of course, there's a lot to say about that, and we can only begin. In fact, I'll only be able to get through a few verses of this because that, this is such an important question to the church. Uh, and it was, a, it was a question that the early church had to answer as well. And so we're going to see what Peter wrote to the early church, and then we're going to see that that same advice applies to us. Uh, and this, this is what he said uh, in summary. The first thing is do not be afraid. And the second is be bold and clear about your beliefs. So we need to not be scared by the world around us and instead witness to the world around us or move from terrified to testifying. Let's pray. Lord, we pray that your grace, your power, and your sacrifice, and your love would be sufficient for us today. That your word would be a strong rock to stand on, a tower of defense, and a light to our path as we walk into a dark world. In Jesus' name, amen. So before we get to the meat of it, uh, Peter does have one fundamental and rather obvious piece of advice to his audience. If you're a Christian living in the first century pagan world, he says, now who will harm you, this is verse 13, if you are eager to do good? In other words, you're a lot less likely to be persecuted if you're generally trying to be a good person, a helpful citizen, somebody who contributes to your community. Who will harm you if you're eager to do good? Right? That's pretty basic. But that doesn't always work. So he says in verse 14, but even if you do suffer for doing what is right, You are blessed. So you may very well suffer. Uh, Even if you're doing your best to be a good person, do the right thing, you may be bullied or persecuted for your beliefs, even if you mean well. Uh, And so what does Peter say about how to live while facing the possibility of persecution? First, verse 14 continues, Do not fear what they fear, and do not be intimidated. So do not fear what they fear. And he's quoting here from Isaiah chapter 8, verses 12 and 13, uh, where the prophet Isaiah says, do not call conspiracy all that this people calls conspiracy. And do not fear what it fears or be in dread. But the Lord of hosts, him you shall regard as holy. Let him be your fear and let him be your dread. So you see what he's saying? Don't fear anything on earth. Everybody around you is going to be fearing different things on earth. Don't fear any of that. Only fear God. That that, that term fear God, right, is kind of scary. We don't want to fear God. Doesn't God love us? Why why would we be afraid of him? And of course, I could talk to you about what the Hebrew fear means, whatever. But let me just say this. What if we we feared God so much that we feared nothing else? That's, That's the way that God's people are being asked to live. Because God is more powerful than any of the people who might attack you, 
any of the people who might persecute you. He's more powerful than any of the armies that might come against you. He's more powerful than any of the forces that surround you. He is more powerful than anything that people on earth fear. So if you're afraid of what people around you might do, you're afraid of the wrong thing. God is much more powerful than they are. So do not fear what they fear, and do not be intimidated, which to Peter's audience specifically means do not let the threats of the pagans get to you. Don't let them intimidate you. Don't let the possibility of being persecuted intimidate you. Instead, verse 15 says, sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. So the cure for fear, according to 1 Peter, is to remember that Jesus is Lord. Sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. So, and not only, of course, is he Lord of the entire universe, but Lord is not like a supervisor, right? So Lord is not like a boss, okay? Lord is powerful. He is sovereign in total control, total mastery of everything that happens in the universe. How could anything happen? outside of his will. And not only that, but he loves you enough to die for you. And because he, who is the Lord of the universe, died, he can give you back a million times whatever the world might take for you. I'm going to say that another way. No matter what people take from you, Jesus Christ died to give you something far better in return. So whatever persecution the world brings, Jesus offers a greater blessing. So, so I'm just going to give you a few examples of what that might have meant to pagans uh, that Peter was, or to Christians living in a pagan world that Peter was writing to. Let's say that some pagan person decides that they don't like you and they want to ruin your reputation. So, and this would happen, of course. So they go around town saying, oh, this, this Christian person, did you hear that they did X, Y, or Z? Did you hear that they, they weight the scales unfairly in their business? Did you hear that they overcharge their customers? Did you hear that he beats his wife? Right? And they, they slander your reputation. So everybody in town views you poorly. It's ruined. That's a way that they could persecute. Take your reputation away. But what can Jesus give you on the cross? Colossians 1.22 says, Now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. That's, that's talking about how you stand in front of God. So people can ruin your reputation with people, make you look bad in front of people, but because Jesus Christ died on the cross, you are holy, blameless, and beyond accusation in the sight of God himself. You see, see how the world can take a small thing, but Jesus Christ can give you back a million times what the world can take by persecuting you. I just want to give a, a couple more examples. Let's say that you're a, an ancient Christian and a pagan person decides, I don't like that guy. I'm going to punish him by isolating him from his family. And they go to the authorities and they had you arrested. And so they, they rob you of all your relationships and stick you in solitary confinement in prison. You're alone, totally isolated. They've stolen your relationships. That's how they chose to persecute you. Ephesians 2.13 reminds us, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near to God by the blood of Christ. So when he died on the cross, Jesus gave you a relationship to God so that people can take your relationships away on earth. But Jesus Christ has given you a relationship that's infinitely more valuable infinitely more precious, a relationship with God. No matter what they take away, let's say that an ancient pagan said, you know what, I'm going to take away the life of a Christian. And this happened too. I'm going to kill the Christians that I don't like in, in my neighborhood, in, in my community. And that happened. Take your life. But we know from John 3.16 that God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that whoever believes in him will not die, but have eternal life. So what, they can even take away your life as a way of persecuting, but Jesus can say, okay, they took away your earthly life, let me give you an eternal life. 
See, whatever the world can take, Jesus can give back something of infinitely greater value because, he, because of his sacrifice on the cross. So no matter what the world takes, Jesus is ready to give us everything back and more. Which is why Peter can say, do not fear what they fear and do not be intimidated. So you don't need to be afraid of the world around you. These pagan people might persecute you. They might take everything. But don't fear them. Rest secure in that knowledge of what Jesus can give you and has given you. They can't take anything. So I, I, I said rest secure. But you can't just rest secure. That, you might as well just hide behind the table at that point if you want to just rest secure. Peter has something else to say. He says, don't be afraid of what they are afraid of, but sanctify Christ as Lord. And then continues in verse 15, saying, always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an account of the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and reverence. So he also wants you to give a defense of your faith to anyone who asks. And what he was asking is he was asking these ancient Christians to be ready to witness to their faith to the pagan world around them, the pagan world that was poised and ready, that was suspicious and hostile, ready to persecute them. He's saying, you, they're ready to persecute you. You need to be ready to give an account of your faith to them. So don't just rest secure in the knowledge that Christ is Lord and he'll restore whatever is taken. But you have to actually be ready to give a defense of that hope. And in order to do that, this, here's the connection. In order to do that, it is crucial to not be afraid. Because when we're afraid of something, we don't engage with it. And if we do engage with it, it's to attack it. It's that fight or flight response, right? You, you either run or you fight. And there's actually one exception, which is rabbits. Rabbits don't run and they don't fight. They stand there and get eaten, right? They freeze. Deer too, like the deer sees the headlights and it just dies. Don't do that either, okay? But the paradigm for the sermon today is, is fight or flight. When we're afraid of things, of people, of groups of people, we either don't engage, we withdraw, or uh, we only engage them by attacking uh, and being hospitable. We're either suspicious or we're hostile. So if ancient Christians were afraid of pagan persecution, what would happen is they would hole up in their houses, and they would only talk to Christians, and they would never engage the pagan world because they're afraid of being persecuted. Or they would just never talk about their faith, right? They would go around about their lives as if they were just normal pagan members of society. Flight. Never bringing up their faith because as soon as the faith comes up, persecution is a possibility. Or if they did happen to get a chance to talk to a pagan about their faith, but they were afraid of that person, they were hostile, then that conversation would look more like, God, you are a dirty, stinking pagan. How could you be such an idiot and such a wretched sinner to not believe that Jesus is Lord? You are so stupid. Right? That's the hostility that comes from fear. You know, still creating that distance. And the problem with that is Peter says, always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands an account from you of the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and reverence. If the early Christians were afraid of the world around them, they would either not say anything about their faith, hide away, or they would talk about their faith with arrogance, spite, contempt, aggression toward the pagan world around them. So the basic logic of Peter is this. You cannot testify if you're terrified. You can't witness if you're afraid of the people you're supposed to witness to. You'll either be suspicious and hide, or you'll be hostile and attack. But with Christ, you have nothing to fear. You have nothing to fear. Let's say that you go out and you share your faith with a pagan, and they kill you. Then the first thing that happens is you meet Christ, and you're with him forever. That's why it says, 
When you suffer for doing what is right, you are blessed. So you can confidently and boldly and kindly talk about your faith. There's nothing to be afraid of. This is what he's telling to people who, by the way, lived under much worse persecution than the, quote, persecution that we face today. I mean, come on, right? Come on. How could you call persecution what we face today in a free country? And he's writing to people who are facing much worse hostility and persecution, even sometimes death, and saying, don't be afraid of that. Go out and boldly and kindly and clearly declare what you believe. Don't be afraid of the people. And this scripture, now this is when it becomes really extremely relevant to us. Because we do live in an environment charged with suspicion and hostility, which has erupted and is liable at any moment and in any place to erupt again in painful incidents. And uh, I'm not a psychologist, but I have been alive for 27 years, so I know something. And I would say a lot of suspicion and hostility is born out of fear. When we're afraid, especially when we're afraid of people, we treat them poorly. We treat them either with suspicion or with hostility. And there is a lot of fear in our world. There's a lot of fear in our country. I mean, there's a lot of fear in, our, in Syracuse, in our city. One of the things that we are called to do as Christians is to be the people that are not afraid. The one group of people in the world that are not afraid of anything. And if we don't live in fear, what happens is we take fuel off of the fire, right? Our culture is like a, is like a pile of kindling with, with oil dumped on it, just waiting for a spark to ignite, right? Just waiting for one more young black man to get hurt by the police, and that spark will set it off, right? Just waiting for one more tweet from the president, and that spark will set it off, right? That's what our culture is set up as, because people are so afraid that they become suspicious and hostile. And Christians are called to not be afraid of anything, to take fuel off that fire of the culture around us. That's part of our witness. Not, and not just because we're so nice. Oh, I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid of terrorists. I'm sure they're nice people. They're not nice people, right? We're not, we're not, we're not free from fear because we're idiots or naive. We're free from fear because of what Jesus Christ has done to guarantee that nothing of value can be taken from us. So I'm going I'm to get really specific here about things that we're afraid of that, in our culture. And it's going to get, we're going to get a little political today, okay? But I was convicted by God. Why, sh why should I be afraid about talking about hot button issues when I'm preaching on not being afraid, Okay? So I'm going to go there today, uh, and, and the Bible really does speak into the situations that we live in as a culture. So where do you see fear? I'm going to, I'm going to name a few things. Fear of, you're going to be surprised, millennials. People are afraid of millennials. I'll talk about, more about that later. People are afraid of Muslims. People are afraid of immigrants. People are afraid of our president and his supporters. Fear, what, what people are afraid of in all of those situations is that that group is going to ruin our country, is going to somehow compromise our culture and cause us to go into some kind of crazy decline. Millennials, all they do is buy avocado toast you know, and lattes. They're going to ruin our culture. Muslims, they're going to come into this country, undermine our values, and kill us with terrorism. They're going to ruin our country. Same thing with immigrants, especially Muslim immigrants. They're going to come and ruin our country. Or the president is, is so inept and so incapable and so immature that he's going to ruin our country. That's the fear. And so, where there's fear, there's suspicion or hostility toward millennials, toward Muslims, toward immigrants, toward the president and his supporters. So tell me if I'm wrong. I just want to get the pulse of, of the congregation right now. Tell me if I'm wrong, but there is fear 
among some people, among most people, that one or more of those groups is going to ruin the country. Seeing no objections, I'm going to continue. Because don't be afraid, right? We're Christians. We're Christians. Most of us are Christians. And if you're not a Christian, imagine what it would be like to be a Christian in light of the following. If our country is ruined, let's just say that our country is absolutely ruined, that Donald Trump tweets out the nuclear codes and, and Russia steals them and launches all our nukes and blows up, right? Our country is ruined. Let's say that all the Muslims in the world come in and every single one of them is a terrorist, which is a ridiculous notion. But let's just say that. And let's say that they ruin our country and they establish Sharia law in, in America. Let's say that. Let's say that millennials never, ever buy houses and they just drink black coffee, uh, cold brew coffee and pour overs all day and they never invest in, in real estate and they just f continue to fail and fail and fail like we're so afraid of. And they never shave their facial hair or their man bun. Let's say that, let's say that one of these groups ruins our country. Philippians 3.20 but our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So even if our country is ruined, when he died on the cross, Jesus Christ made us citizens of a better country, a better nation. Even if our world was destroyed and ruined, you read Revelation, it promises a new heavens and a new earth where we will live because of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So we don't need to be afraid of any of those things. Okay? We're not afraid of the same things that everybody else is afraid of, which means that we may not agree with other people, but we don't fear them. And if we don't fear them is where we get to the second part. We don't have to avoid them, and we don't need to be hostile to them. We can be bold, clear, and compassionate about our faith. So I'm, I'm going to touch on each of these groups that I mentioned. So buckle up. Let's talk about millennials. I'm not afraid of millennials, okay? I'm a millennial. Guilty, okay? But there is a lot of hostility and suspicion of millennials in our culture. Are they ever going to get jobs? Do they even know what work is, right? We've heard that. Some, I'm looking at some of the millennials out there, and they're like, yep, heard that one before. Right? There's, millennials are so entitled. How can we have a culture built on entitlement? And I just want to say this. We didn't give ourselves participation trophies. Okay? Those participation trophies came from somebody. We didn't go to the store and buy them and give them to ourselves. So let me just lay that objection to rest. Okay? But let's get serious. Because there are, there are a lot of churches, and I, I would say ours is one of them. It's like, well, we, we would love to have young people in our church. We want millennials. We want to attract the young families. But there's a disconnect between distrustful, offensive, hostile rhetoric and thoughts about millennials and the desire to have millennials in the church, right? How, that doesn't really square. It's like I, I heard a story about a pastor in Texas who said, gosh, I just don't know why we can't attract black people to our church. And there was a church consultant in there and he said, look behind you at the Confederate flag that's behind your desk. Right? If you have a Confederate flag behind your desk, we want to attract black people is a load of garbage. If the rhetoric about millennials is based on fear, suspicion, and hostility, how is there going to be witness? How is there going to be real, compassionate, clear, bold witness to young people? It's not going to happen. I'd also like to, I need to touch on Muslim, Muslim immigrants and refugees, because uh, I think this is such a clear, clear case. Um, and again, I'm not going to tell you how to vote, but I'm going to offer a Christian perspective on how to deal with people, okay? So a while back there was this controversy on do we let Muslim refugees into America? And one of the common things that was said is, well, if we let the refugees in, they might bring terrorists. Terrorists might come in too. That could harm our country. And that's a legitimate concern. Right? So we're not supposed to be stupid. We're not supposed to be rash. Right? Jesus didn't just jump off the temple when Satan said jump off the temple. So we need to be prudent. 
But let's reframe that question for a quick second. What if instead of being afraid that Muslims might come and kill us, because we're Christians and we know that, let's say they do. If you suffer for doing what is right, you are blessed. To live as Christ, to die, is gain. Then we go to heaven and we're with God. But what if we reframe that and we're not afraid anymore? What would happen? And I'll just suggest, currently what we're doing as the church is sending missionaries far away to dangerous countries to witness to Muslim people. And those missionaries are dying a lot faster than we are. They're in a lot more danger than we are. And now we have a situation where you're saying, we're going to send thousands of Muslims to America where it's safe for you to witness to them. And you're going to say, no, we're going to turn them away from a Christian perspective. You can't say that from a Christian perspective. National security perspective, okay. You know, you got to do what you got to do. But I'm talking Christian perspective. You see that difference? How suspicion and fear when that rules what we do, cuts off an opportunity to give an account, a defense of the hope that, w that is within us. And I'll just give one more example, because I've picked on a certain group of people, and I want to even it out. Let's talk about the president, okay? And fortunately, he's repealed the Johnson Amendment, so I can say whatever I want about him, and will still be tax-free. So that's awesome, but I won't. There is so much hostility and suspicion about President Donald Trump and his supporters that it is totally dividing our country, okay? Not just our country, but Christians, which is our big concern. And if you don't believe me, just go on Facebook for crying out loud, okay? I'm not, I, I'm not crazy here. And the problem is, it's tempting to act as though this president, this one guy, and all the people who like him are somehow going to be able to undermine everything that this country stands for. They're going to plunge us back into the dark ages. This is the, this is the narrative. And you know what? Maybe it's true. Maybe it's true that every Muslim is a terrorist. But even if that's true, and the country goes to crap, We're citizens of a different country, of heaven. So there's, there's no need to hate people who disagree politically and unfriend them on Facebook. That's called suspicion. That's called hiding behind the table. Okay? There's no need to be hostile. Say, how could you ever think that way? How could you ever vote that way? That's creating division when there's an opportunity to have a unified witness, when you're not afraid that means you can have a conversation. And, and I want to be clear that the whole point of why I'm talking about how do we talk to millennials? What's our attitude toward, what's our attitude toward Muslim immigrants? What's our attitude toward Donald Trump? Is not so that Christians can be such good citizens of America. We should be very good citizens. It's not so that we can lubricate the wheels of a functioning pluralistic society, although I do believe that Christianity can do that. The, the whole reason that we're not afraid, why that's important, why we're not suspicious, why we're not hostile, is what Peter says. So that we are ready at all times to give a defense when asked to give an account of the hope that is within us. That is the name of the game. And any group of people that you fear, that you regard with suspicion and hostility, are closed off from you being able to witness to that group of people. That doesn't mean you have to agree. Lord knows I don't agree with Muslims. I wouldn't have this job if I, I hope I wouldn't have this job if I agreed with Muslims about everything. But that doesn't mean that, with, that I can't have compassion and reverence and, and have a conversation about my faith. That's clear and bold and not afraid of what might happen. That's the name of the game. And, and Peter gives us a summary. What is the hope that lies within us. And it, he has this in verse 18. You might suffer, but what's the hope that lies within you? For Christ also suffered for sins once for all. The righteous, that's him, for the unrighteous, that's us, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, 
but made alive in the Spirit. If you can say nothing else about what you believe, say 1 Peter 3, verse 18, Christ suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, so that we can come to God unafraid, bold, and confident. He was put to death in the flesh, just like we will die in the flesh, but he was made alive in the Spirit. One day we'll be made alive again. Everything that we lost will come back. There's nothing to be afraid of. Wouldn't we be remiss if we didn't give an account of that to the world around us? Glory to God. Amen.